Okay. Well, great. Thanks. Uh, I hope you guys can uh, hear and see me. Um, really want to thank everybody for being a part of this. I'm very excited. This is, a, this is our first use of Remo. I've been jumping around and networking with some of you, and uh, I hope you're uh, you're taking advantage of it. The uh, I know it's a little confusing at first, but um, it really is a powerful tool, and it gets pretty simple once you figure it out. Um, the what we've been hearing from a lot of our members is, look, we're great. We're offering great programming and uh, a great chance to to hear some you know terrific speakers like we will today. But uh, but people miss talking to each other and seeing each other, and so this platform allows you to do that. Uh, and I and I hope if you weren't able to do it today, that you'll be able to to do it at a, at a different time. Uh, we're we're uh, this is our you all are the guinea pigs, and uh, we'd love to hear from you. So if you uh, you know uh, send us an email or drop drop uh, some comments in the chat, that'd be great. Um, so today's uh, today's program is is an important one, uh, and it's brought to you by the HR and Professional Development Committee uh, that's uh, headed up by by Jonathan. And thank you for your service. Uh, and it's brought to you by uh, one of our really tremendous members and sponsors, Career Source South Florida, who's been doing a great uh, deal of work in uh, in really making sure that we uh, avert layoffs in as much as possible and get people back to work if they had been laid off. So uh, you'll hear from Rick in just a, a few minutes. We Today's uh, session is all about, uh, you know, reopening. We're, I'm actually uh, here at our office. Uh, so we're actually, you know, wrestling with the same thing. Uh, you know, but there are a lot of questions. We all have them. You know, what are the OSHA requirements? Um, you know, what, what's the role of HR in, in assessing the and promoting the new corporate culture, because some of us are going to be sort of this hybrid uh, model, um, you know, and when you when you return to work, what are the policies that you should be implementing to make sure that it's a safe practice? Uh, and what are others thinking about and doing? Um, and then also the um, what's your responsibility as an employer uh, in terms of uh, keeping your folks safe and your customers and clients safe uh, and, and, and yet still still open. So all those questions we're going to be exploring today and We've got some great uh, speakers that that will be able to to talk on it, and then answer your questions. and And speaking of answering, I think one of the things that we want you to do is um, is to write the write your questions. And I'm not sure if we have a, a Q and A box. I'm not seeing it, but if we don't write your questions uh, either in the Q and A box or uh, in the chat, because that way we can float them up to our uh, our presenters. Uh, we will be muted. Uh, during the presentation, so if you want to get a question asked, we can do that. Alfred, just to chime in, there there is a Q and A box to the far right side, uh, and they can put the Q questions in there, and then they also can vote on questions. So if they like a question okay. that someone Great. put up, they can vote and it'll move up. I'm probably not seeing it because I'm a speaker. So yeah, so th thanks for jumping in on that. That's important. Yeah, so put it in the Q and A because that helps us not miss. Uh, one of your questions, right? That we've got folks working behind the scenes, queuing in on the Q and A. So please do that. Use the chat to uh, to c continue to connect with one another. If you have any information you want to drop in there uh, to share, uh, keep your eyes on it because uh, we will be dropping, and some of our speakers will be dropping important links and stuff like that in there. So, so you know, we're, we're really trying to make best use of everything here. Uh, so as I said, look, the, the, the chamber is not funded publicly. We're we're funded by the generosity of our members and by our sponsors. And uh, programs like this wouldn't be possible without that. And uh, today's sponsors, I said, is Career Source South Florida. Um, and uh, and I want to bring Rick up uh, in a second. Rick's the executive director of Career Source South Florida. He's also the incoming chair of the chamber, and has been a tremendous force for innovation for us in terms of being able to uh, swivel and pivot into helping uh, in this new COVID environment, a lot of the small businesses that were really looking for access to capital to keep open uh, and, uh, and avoid laying off their people. Uh, we were able to train many of our staffs and, and are still working to helping those folks apply for uh, the actual money, apply for the forgiveness and PPP and other things and access the, there's a lot of, uh, a lot of, uh, um, 
uh, services and programs out there to help your business. But uh, people have questions and they need some handholding sometimes. So uh, so thanks to Rick and Career Source, we've really been able to do that. Hey, before I turn it over to him, I just want to remind everybody we are recording this session. And um, if you need to or want to share it uh, with some of your staff, uh, come back to our website later on. It'll be posted there. So, Rick, thank you again for Career Sources uh, sponsorship of today's event. I want to give you a chance to say a few words. I think Rick, if you turn on your mic and your uh, and your camera, you'll be able to come up right up. Well, we we may have lost Rick, uh, uh, John Jonathan. If if um, can you can you signal me and to, to see if uh, if we're having technical problems or should I move on? I tell you what, I'm going to move on. Um, the uh, Rick should be able to come on stage now. Okay. Uh, I just reactivated him. All he's going to do is turn on his camera and he should be okay. Okay. Sorry about jumping back up and down. I just no, wanted... no, no, please. That, 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 that's fine. Rick, can you uh, come on stage? Yeah, just turn on your camera, Rick, and, and your uh, microphone. Yeah, he has authorization. He might be having technical difficulties. He's on his side. Well, I mean, we'll we'll help you and connect it, and we can give him up time to come up later if you want. Okay. Right. Well, um, well, while you're up here still, Jonathan, I mean, you haven't been formally introduced. You opened our program, but I want to thank you uh, for for being a part of this, for be for leading the uh, the chambers uh, HR and special development committee. I think you've been doing a great job. You've actually turned us on to Remo, which is I think a great uh, platform for us to be able to network together. Um, you know, you've been you've been a member for a long time and has done an incredible amount of work. I know that you have your own uh, uh, shop now, but you've also worked with uh, a Jim Sherm and uh, and other uh, organizations. So you have brought tremendous knowledge to the chamber and to our committee. And I want to thank you for that. And I'll turn over the the stage to you now. All right, sir. Well, thank you. Uh, so, uh, Alfred, thank you so much. And then whenever you're, if you want to. Go off and get perfect. There we go. Uh, we're, we're still getting a little bit of the clinks out. That's one of the reasons why we did it on one of our smaller scale events. And I know I still see a lot of people coming on. Uh, if you know anybody that's having issues, have them email the chamber and we'll get them in. But we're, like I said, we, like Alfred said, excuse me, we're going to have this recorded. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and keep us moving along. And like I said, we'll have, pl well, like we said, we'll have plenty of question and answer time at the end. But we're going to have kind of a TED Talk style. Uh, of presentations from each of our presenters, and then we'll have more time to talk with them, both Q&A at the end, as well as uh, networking at the end also. Um, I wanna go ahead and, and, and introduce Aaron Tandy. He's a member of our HR committee that I serve on with the chamber. He's a partner at uh, Pathman Lewis LLP, and he heads up the employment law section. Uh, he helps businesses navigate federal, state, local employment laws and assist in business excuse me, assist businesses in developing employment policies and practices and programs, that is, to promote a positive work environment. He's been doing this for almost 25 years, uh, working with all different sizes and shapes of HR departments. He's been a real asset to us, and I will tell you, he's going to bring you lots of great data today. Uh, don't let it overwhelm you. He kind of scared me a little bit with some of the data, but it's good to know a person like him when you need it. So without further ado, I want to bring up Aaron. Aaron, if you could turn on and you can take over from here. And without right. further ado, Aaron, we are. take it away. All right. So I want to thank Jonathan. Uh, I want to thank Alfred uh, for the opportunity to help. Uh, I'm going to play a dual role here. I'm going to be both your moderator and one of the panelists. Um, one of the things that Alfred said, I think, is going to be really key. Uh, the panelists and I were, my fellow panelists, uh, Beverly Clampett and Dr. Uh, Fernando Mendoza, were talking before the program about just how interactive our various disciplines are. And so I hope you will be able to take away some helpful information, not only about what HR can do about um, keeping and expanding and promoting your company's culture in this sort of hybrid workspace that we now have, uh, but also 
issues about contact tracing um, and keeping your employees healthy and informed. Um, and so the way this program is going to work, um, I think it's already been alluded to, um, I'm going to introduce our other two panelists, and I'm going to bat clean up with some of the scary law uh, issues. Um, but hopefully, um, that will be uh, going on. Um, so without further ado, I'd like to introduce, although I see Mr. Beasley is, is now on my speaker screen. Um, Hi, Aaron. Yes. Is, Sorry to interject here, but right before we begin the panel discussion, let's give Rick Beasley a moment to deliver his sponsor remarks, then we can continue with the panel. Excellent. Discussion. That's what I thought was happening. Sorry, uh, Rick, take it away. I'm going to put my camera off. All right. Can everyone hear me now? I apologize. Uh, I, I realize with um, with this new uh, Remo, you can't do it from your cell phone. So I had to pull over and put my laptop up here. So I'm glad that everyone's on. But I, I do want to commend our uh, our HR committee for the work that they're doing. Uh, again, Alfred, you and your staff are doing a fantastic job of how we can reengage and bring um, our employers back online. You know, COVID has. Um, been a challenge. Uh, it's not something that we, you know, it's, it's an item that we can overcome if we all work together as a community, as a business community, to be able to help grow uh, Miami-Dade County. So uh, I think this uh, this workshop, this, this seminar that you all are putting on, uh, key considerations for safe and successful return back to the office, it's very important, a conversation that we should be having. Uh, for those who may not know, uh, Alfred and I are going to be joining uh, Mayor Cava today. Uh, in her announcement of a new initiative called uh, Renew 305. Uh, it's an effort uh, with the chamber, uh, with Miami-Dade College, all our training vendors here in, in Dade County, Career Source, the Beacon Council, Miami-Dade Chamber, a number of other partner agencies, looking at how we can retrain, reskill, uh, <laughs> bring our folks back uh, in alignment, and again, renew um, our Miami-Dade County area. and. The chamber is going to be a vital, uh, a part of that conversation and how we help grow our business. So this conversation that we're having today is important. And so to let you all know, Career Source, you know, our role here is to invest in our community, to help grow our community, work with the chamber, work with our business community to be able to grow uh, talent so that we can keep companies here, we can get people back to work and very vital. But those individuals that you all know that are still having difficulty, with unemployment benefits, please have them reach out. Telephone number 305-929-1547. That number again, 305-929-1547. You can reach out to that number if you need assistance for your unemployment benefits, or if you're looking for work, we can get you connected. And then please reach out to the chamber for our layoff aversion program that we launched in partnership with the chamber, the Beacon Council, Chemical, and Tools for Change. Those organizations are there to provide you a grant to help um, to reimburse you for those uh, services uh, or uh, equipment that you bought uh, because of COVID uh, to keep people working. We reimburse you up to $10,000, but our Chamber of Commerce, um, uh, Tanya and her staff have been doing a great job of getting that information out and, and, and approving loans, approving grants. So we're glad about that. So again, this conversation we're having today is very important. Career Source is very proud to be a sponsor. And anything, uh, Alfred, that we can do to continue to help grow uh, businesses and help keep people working, we're there at the table with you. So now how do I turn this back over to uh, Jeff? Okay, there we go. I think you, you turn off your camera and your mic and, we're, and Rick, you'll disappear from the stage. Excellent. So, um, back uh, again. So I'm going to ask, uh, we're going to bring Dr. Mendoza up uh, to talk to you about contact tracing um, and the need to make sure that your um, employment uh, facility is up to date and up to speed. So before I do, let me introduce him. Dr. Mendoza is a board certified uh, doctor in pediatric and pediatric emergency medicine. He founded and is the CEO of Scribus LLC, um, which is a company that provides COVID screening and contract tracing for schools, businesses, and healthcare facilities. 
Dr. Mendoza created a proprietary contact tracing program that has been instrumental in helping to open schools uh, in our community. Um, Dr. Mendoza is a graduate of Brown University and the University of Florida uh, College of Medicine. He's a fellow of the American Academy of Pediatrics and the American College of Emergency Physicians. I'm gonna turn the stage over to Dr. Mendoza and thank him for uh, taking time out of his very busy day to join us for some important information. And then just a, a, an announcement, we'll be taking uh, questions for all of the panelists uh, at the end. So just put your questions in the Q&A button and we'll go for there. Um, and without further ado, Dr. Mendoza, the stage is yours. Thank you, Aaron. Uh, and I wanna thank the, the chamber for inviting me and the rest of the panelists to speak today on, a, on this really important topic. And, and it's my first time speaking at the chamber and, and very much welcome the opportunity. So uh, as Aaron mentioned, uh, my background started off in pediatric emergency medicine and, uh, and pediatrics. And I'm actively practicing uh, emergency physician here in Miami, Florida at a local large hospital, Baptist Hospital in the pediatric ER there. Um, and I want to take a step back and talk about Scribus, the company, real quick. We actually started off as a, a medical scribe company and healthcare staffing company back in 2014. And how we kind of got into contact tracing and healthcare screening during the pandemic was that we started to, um, uh, you know, we were staffing PD, uh, emergency rooms, urgent cares, doctors' offices, and you know, our, our employees are pretty much considered critical need employees at, at the bedside and at, at the side of physicians. Uh, and PAs and nurse practitioners documenting for the uh, for the providers uh, for the patient experience in, into the electronic healthcare system. So when a pandemic hit, we started getting you know uh, employees who were becoming exposed, uh, who having exposures to COVID or getting sick with COVID, and we had to track them and figure out you know how to keep our workforce active and how to keep our workforce safe and who we had to pull off a shift and put on the shift. And we realized that if we were having this issue. There certainly must be other critical need employers and companies and schools across the country or across the county uh, that had these same needs. So we evolved into and pivoted to this uh, contact tracing and uh, healthcare screening uh, uh, service line. Uh, we still maintain our core business, but this is a much uh, this is a rapidly growing uh, part of our company. So, uh, and as a pediatric ER doctor, I still see COVID in the ER and as in my patient population, so I can keep track of what's going on in the community. But this is a really important point that. We started doing contact tracing, what we call an employee exposure management program within our company to keep our company's doors open so we could keep our employees safe and actually put them in the workplace, back in the workplace when they were ready to come back. So I'll share my screen and see if I can do this. And I only have a few slides. Uh, the deck is really short, uh, but let's see if I can do this, uh, you know, and do it, uh, do it well. Uh, okay. So. Really, it's, it's, I'm going to talk a little bit about what, how to keep your business open during COVID-19. It's been really difficult. At first, everyone scurried back at home, remote working from home, when possible, happened very quickly. Uh, but like we've been talking about offline uh, before this was people crave social interaction. And the workplace can be more productive. You get people coming in face-to-face uh, -face interactions, or at least in, in, the, in the office. And quite honestly, uh, some businesses cannot be remote. Um, so let's talk about what is contact tracing. What I'm going to focus on is really an employee exposure management program for your business. Contact tracing at the Department of Health level or at the municipal, uh, state level or, or country level is really figuring out who's positive for COVID, whether it's COVID or actually even flu or measles, any communicable disease, right, uh, which any kind of outbreak. And it's been much less pronounced in the years past because, you know, certain kind of things, whether it's an E. coli, break, break, e. coli breakout somewhere or some kind of listeria breakout at some, you know, but now COVID is obviously, you know, it's a pandemic. So everyone's aware what contact tracing is, but the contact tracing and at the government level is, you know, or department of health level is you, is someone calling you to figure out, you know, if you're positive, if you're net, you've been positive, who you've been in contact with and tracking your symptoms. And that's pretty much it ends there. What we're really talking about is an employee exposure management program, which is contact tracing localized to your company. Uh, we want to find out who's been exposed, who's positive, who's at risk for being positive, and how that's going to affect your workplace. So really, an employee exposure management program combines technology we use or anybody can use, you know, kind of whether it's a phone-based app or computer-based app to report in to uh, either by the employee or by the student. We do a lot of schools. Um, or by the employer uh, to say, hey, someone called in sick today and they work with us, 
uh, and to figure out who's been exposed. We have medical direction. You need someone to really kind of figure out how to implement these CDC guidelines and how to implement the local uh, county and, and state guidelines, how, do that, how it applies to your business, and really keeping track of the employer risk status. Okay, so, and above all, this employee exposure management program or any employee exposure management program has to keep your data with HIPAA compliant confidential. So only the few people that need to know what's going on with the company do know. And I think Aaron will talk about that a little later on in, in, in the program. So what does it mean for your business? I mean, whether you're a critical need business or not, if you have, uh, we know most exposures, you know, what's been happening over the past few months is most exposures have really been happening at uh, the social, outside the workplace uh, uh, kind of venues, whether it's social gatherings, uh, family gatherings, interactions in restaurants, things like that, or, or other places that are, where people congregate, that's where most of the exposures are happening. They're actually not really happening um, in schools. You know, we know that. We know, with, you know, there's a lot of mask wearing, a lot of uh, mitigation strategies have been, in, in, been enforced. But a contact tracer and employee exposure management program can help to identify when that exposure or someone who's been exposed or is positive comes into contact with the rest of your employees and, and figure out what their symptoms are, track their symptoms, you know, keep it all on one place with that one person that's assigned to your company, keep medical direct. You can keep certain parts of your company uh, up and running. Um, it also allows for your business to get back to the business of doing what you guys do. So what we saw very quickly, we were dealing, we're, we're doing contact tracing for hospitals locally, for schools locally, is that people were getting pulled from all directions who don't normally do this job to figure out and do phone calls. And you can't just do something on an iPhone. We do that. We have, you know, mobile apps to report in, but that doesn't tell you, get it, you know, that contact tracer or, or that person who's figuring out what's happening to an employee, it doesn't get, you know, need to get on the phone with the employee and say, were you in a carpool situation? Were you in the break room? Who did you eat lunch with? And really only as it pertains to your company in an effort to make sure that you mitigate any outbreaks or any more exposures. If you're pulling in directors, VPs, uh, front lines, you know, kind of, uh, 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 you know, secretaries who don't normally do this, it can really be out of their wheelhouse and also pulls away the resources where you normally need to do to keep your business open. So these you know, are the kind of questions we ask, you know, does one of your employees, you know, test for, for COVID-19, uh, you know, we help form or you need someone to help form your company's return to work strategy. For some companies, it's much more, uh, a little more rapid. There's certainly a situation where you need to figure out if you need to bring your workforce a little quicker. Uh, if someone's been vaccinated already, now there's new quarantine uh, or lack or, or reduced quarantine or, or no quarantine recommendation from the CDC for recently vaccinated individuals. Um, who's most mission critical? Uh, those are all things you can really help define with an employee exposure management program. There's obviously, you know, you know, following CDC guidelines is going to be, you know, mandatory to make sure you have a workplace that's functional and it keeps keeps on going. Okay, so staying home, monitoring the health, social distancing. I think we'll talk about that with with a little later in the program. Um, but remember, you know, continue to cover your masks, to clean. Um, um, uh, to clean surfaces in, in, in the workplace, and if, for sure, which is what a COVID employee exposure management program does or contact tracing does, is containing any potential exposure or outbreak. You know, vaccines are a big question. So we have vaccines coming into the population now, mostly all, anybody 65 or over, frontline healthcare workers and frontline individuals um, will certainly uh, be the ones who are, are, are prioritized. Uh, but as it starts to roll out, um, as it starts to roll out and to 55 and older and eventually general population, even teachers, employees, regular employees, you're going to want to know who in your who in your workforce is, is vaccinated, what that means, what kind of vaccine they have, how long has it been and what that really means for quarantine steps. So that's really um, kind of kind of a gist of what a, uh, a contact tracing program does. And I'm going to go ahead and, and stop my share real quick. Let's see here. I think I stopped sharing, right? Did I stop sharing? I'm on, right? Um, so uh, that's kind of the gist of what what um, uh, you know contact tracing for the workplace is, and how it's different from a Department of Health or kind of municipality uh, version of a contact tracing um, uh, program. Uh, we found very effective strategies to you know, mitigate exposures within school settings, very very large school settings, to the point where we've had 
uh, in the past six to eight months, uh, no, uh, no documented school in school or in business exposures, um, been able to mitigate those those exposures within the within the classroom and, and school setting uh, very effectively to keep the schools open because you know we we definitely need to get the kids back to school and certainly workplaces can't afford to be shut down for much longer. So I'll stop here and go back to uh, Aaron. I think uh, I think that's enough for my time for right now, right? Thank you very much, Dr. Mendoza. Um, so we'll come back uh, and bring Dr. Mendoza up for the Q and A portion a little later. Uh, so if you do have some questions uh, for him, please do put it in the Q&A. But right now, I have the pleasure of introducing Beverly Clampett. Uh, Ms. Clampett is the Group Director of Human Resources for Momentum Consulting Group. Uh, Momentum is a company that's been in existence for over two decades, uh, providing um, and delivering uh, project-based and professional uh, services to a variety of public and private sector businesses, and as a leading IT consulting firm. Uh, on behalf of the chamber, I also want to congratulate Momentum because for the 11th year in a row, uh, they have been named one of the best places to work from the uh, South Florida Business uh, Journal, and they'll figure out where they fall on that list uh, this week. But congratulations to them, especially in a COVID year, uh, which obviously, as we all know, has been very challenging. Um, Beverly herself has extensive experience in developing and shaping HR strategies to identify, retain, promote, um, engage, and develop uh, value talent and promote uh, cultural corporate initiatives. Um, her clients are too numerous to mention here, uh, but Beverly brings her own unique touch to every client experience. Beverly's gonna to talk to us about keeping our employees engaged in a hybrid situation as we transition back to work. And without further ado, I'd ask Beverly to join me on the stage and I will disappear again. We may be having a bit of technical difficulty. I'm gonna turn my camera on and off again and hopefully uh, Beverly will actually come back up on stage. Hang on one second. Okay, can you see me now? Everything good? My camera's on and my mic is on. So yes, you're Stephanie, good. okay, great. I'm so glad to get the thumbs up on that one. So let's give this a second try. Aaron, as you were mentioning, you know, we are a technology consulting firm. So it, it's, it's been fortunate that it's been a bit easier for us as we've gone through this journey. Um, I, I wanna put in perspective that as we think about return to work with Momentum, we have both field consulting uh, staff and they're at their client sites. We also have, um, uh, corporate employees as well. So I'd like for us, as we think about where we're going to take just a minute and look at where we've been. And I think what I'm gonna share uh, may relate to your company as well. There are things that we can certainly look, look, um, look forward to uh, learning from. So let's take a second and think back in time to February 25th, 2020. The world and indeed the world of work was on the cusp of major change with the emergence of the novel coronavirus later known as COVID-19. So think back, what was going on in your company this time last year? What kinds of plans were you putting into place to, to respond to this pending pandemic? And as, as, as I said earlier, I think we can learn from where we've been and apply that to where, where we're heading. Let me share a little bit with you about what Momentum was doing to respond. Um, as always, we're staying in tune with our clients and their varied responses to business operations. We still have to do that. Uh, as they were facing their own challenges, those in turn became ours. As an example, we have cl uh, clients who are, who are in the cruise line industry, so certainly facing some challenges. We were monitoring employees who were traveling. That was so new for us at that time. And then thinking about potential quarantine if that was needed. We even had to help employees who were stuck outside of the United States. We had to make sure, as we still do, that we're adhering to all of the workplace safety requirements and communicating these to our employees. We had to make, and we still have to make, 
uh, decisions that touch on our precious culture. Even our beloved company picnic, a favorite at Momentum, was scheduled for early March, and that was on the table. Surely our picnic wouldn't be a casualty, but it was. Still missed by most. Um, the same holds true for things like our amazing holiday party and the numerous team-based and client-based social gatherings that we were so accustomed to. We were really busy prepping for a virtual work world if that were to become necessary for a while. On March the 17th, we announced that we were closing the office by exception only uh, through May the 1st. We really weren't sure what was ahead for us. We were fortunate that as an IT focused organization, our people could work remotely and do a wonderful job permitting that that was okay with their clients. We had to make, and maybe some of you are still making these, some time sensitive real estate decisions. Our company owners had in hand a real estate uh, lease that would have more than doubled our footprint in our current office. Fortunately, we were able to put that on pause. Space and how we configure our offices are still decisions that we have to work through in our near and long-term future as we consider return to work. Our virtual team, our executive team met and huddled every single day. Uh, that's so, been so important. We as an executive team have had to come even closer so that together we can anticipate and navigate the business challenges that would come our way. That has enabled us to remain very strong during this storm. A key strength of Momentum's longtime success is our trusted mutual relationships with our clients. We've stayed close to them and in turn with our, with our associates. Agility and flexibility, big part of our DNA. So we've really had to lean into this and we still do. I'm sure your organization, and, and I heard earlier the, the, the value that was placed on retaining as many of our valued employees as we possibly could and continue to grow where the opportunities uh, present themselves. I will say now we're finding ourselves in a really nice, a nice growth uh, pattern. So we uh, also, again, like you, had to de quickly develop a great plan and communicate how we would respond to the FFCRA, the, that new requirement. And you know, we'll still see what changes lie ahead for that. We've also had to remain up to speed. We think about you know people working. Um, what's going on in the ever-changing world of U.S. immigration. And we see a lot of changes with that, and we always have to think about how that touches our, our people and how it touches them during pandemic times. For example, you know, the, some of the consulates you know, outside of the United States were closed. You know, how, how could we um, have people process during that time? Our full-fledged return to work that we planned for May the 1st proved not to be a reality. We looked forward to phase three. We provided webinars, wonderful webinars to educate all of our associates on our return to work policy that we so carefully worked together to create and the adaptations that we made in the office to adhere to safety standards. As we know, and that phase three didn't happen at that time. Some of our clients, and maybe that's some of you who are in this audience as well, have had scaled back uh, their office staff and others were beginning to call people back. We're seeing more of that now, by the way. Many of our associates were, were comfortable with going back into their clients' uh, work settings. You know, they felt okay about it. We had others who weren't and they had some concern. So how, do we ha how did we and how do we handle it as, as people start returning to work with our clients? We have to have empathy. We have to listen and we have to work through these situations on an individual basis. We still hear clients in the candidates, rather in our recruitment process, who are saying that they are very hesitant uh, to come back into physical offices and they really prefer a virtual work setting. Perhaps that's something you're experiencing as well. well let's talk for a second about the critical role of communication as we think about coming back to work and, and you know, wherever we are in that journey. Communication has been more critical to our success than ever. Uh, we've had communication vary from company-wide, major state of the business type of communications from our top executives, as well as smaller announcements and more personal communications too. Our leaders have had to uh, communicate even closer with their teams. And you know, I think that doesn't change, whether we're in a virtual setting or a hybrid setting. Um, 
importance of keeping people connected is something we are very aware of. You know, as leaders, it's really important for us to even just reach out one-on-one -on -one to our people. Maybe it's a quick phone call. How is your, how are you doing? How is your family doing? So if you think you've communicated a lot already, find more ways to do it. It's very important. It has been where we've been and it's going to be in where we're going. I think the same holds true for employee engagement. That is a top priority for momentum. And it'll be an area of focus as we move through the, our future world of work and returning to work. And we'll be all the better for it, I believe. As an example, right now, we're having to look at how do we um, you know, connect with and recognize employees you know, in an em employee appreciation week. We also found that our employees, and again, maybe this is a challenge that you have as well, um, were not able to use all of their vacation time in the year 2020. You know, they couldn't travel or you know, based on you know, other situations, it just wasn't going to happen. We knew this was the right time to make that shift to an integrated PTO plan, something we'd been considering for a while. So it's in place for 2021. And we allowed a limited rollover of 2020 vacation into 2021. But best of all, what we've done, uh, we allowed our people to cash out their unused at that time vacation time uh, for cash. And the payment came to them at a very welcome time, which was the last paycheck in December. Um, I, I, we think about leave time. I know that was one of the things that I was asked to, to weave in as well. I think the challenge ahead for all of us is to reinforce the importance of taking time away from work to recharge, to focus on well-being, and to avoid burnout. No matter where you are on that spectrum from you're still in virtual work, you're partially back, you're a hybrid, or you're fully back, we find that these days people are probably putting in more time and maybe working even harder than they ever have. So now for the exciting part. What's ahead in the, uh, the return to work journey for us at this point? We're continuing to stay close to our clients. And what we're hearing is that more are phasing in more physical return to work later during 2021, possibly with more comfort, you know, as vaccines become available. And others are still talking about maybe it's 2022 that they're bringing everybody back and they're trying to figure what does that look like? Uh, our associates have, are telling us they always have that they value flexibility. That's important for engagement. And they've always wanted to have a little bit of you know, flexibility to work from home. They've proven that they handle that extremely well. They're able to deliver. And yet, because we're consulting, they also need to be, a, be there on site for our clients. So um, others are saying, you know, I know this flexibility is great. I miss being co collect connected with people. I miss being in a physical office and I really need a change of scenery other than my house. So we have formed a steering committee that'll create that future uh, plan of work and return to work for momentum. And we're doing it by beginning with the end in mind. We're challenging ourselves to think several years ahead in the future and plan for what our company's growth needs are and what our employees' needs and perhaps even their wishes are when we're thinking about what does return to look, work look like? What does the office space look like? What's configuration of the office? All of this for us looks like it's landing at a hybrid model. And our strategy that we come up with are gonna inform what do we need in terms of uh, things that touch people, our processes, you know, and our technology needs. So we're thinking about, like when you think about the health and well-being of, of our people, we also have to think about what about the health and well-being of our information. Back to engagement, back to culture. At Momentum, we believe culture wins, hands down. If you ask someone what it means to work with us, it means um, they'll, they'll talk about culture, they'll talk about support, they'll talk about it being a very family experience for them. We don't take that culture for granted, and it has been painfully aware for us that during the time that people have been remote, and as we're bringing them, we have to think about bringing them, what that looks like, bringing them back into the office, back to work, that we need to do even more than we've ever done. Uh, we might, we talked earlier, and uh, Aaron and Dr. Mendoza, you might have, I believe you touched on that importance of connectedness as well. 
We're, we're very aware of that. Uh, and you might find simple ways to do it. Um, could be something as simple as something we've started doing. We'll have an impromptu Zoom to sing happy birthday, painfully off key, by the way, uh, to a colleague or to celebrate their work anniversary um, at the holidays, like even my own team. We had a, a wonderful virtual luncheon. We could meet together, but we could send DoorDash vouchers. Um, we had surprise gifts decked out in holiday attire. Mine was the Grinch, for anybody who wants to know. Um, and we had a virtual gingerbread house decorating contest for a little healthy competition and creativity, uh, along with a, a Hanukkah a Christmas trivia contest. It was just wonderful in a very warm way. Spend a little bit of time together. And we long for the time that we can do more of that and have our picnics and do all of these things together very soon. Well-being, that's an important focus for us as well as we look forward into 2021 and beyond. We're planning more in-person events and when we can and virtual events even now that will allow people to uh, look at all the ways well-being touches their lives. Coming up soon, we'll have a yoga well, um, mindfulness, uh, sort of a lunch and learn, for lack of a better word, um, that people can participate in and virtual workshops on financial well-being as well. So in closing, we are looking forward to better times ahead as vaccinations become available and, and the impact that that will have on our ability to then bring more people back into the, um, to the, to the workspace. We look forward to, to our value clients, to you, uh, strengthening your businesses just as we're strengthening ours. We look forward to continuing to be adaptable and flexible with everything that comes our way. I think we all have to. And finally, in HR, those of us at HR, we look forward to remaining the trusted partners to our business, to our valued people, so that we keep what's best for them in focus all the time. Thank you so much for giving me this time. I appreciate it. I'll turn it back over. Thank you very much, Beverly. So uh, before we get to the q and I'm gonna talk about some uh, legal and practical considerations for opening the office. Um, to do that, I, I wanna make mention of a publication that most people should be familiar with, and if you're not, please, please get yourself familiar with it. It's an OSHA publication from January 29th, 2021. I put into the chat the name of the piece, I'm going to name it, and the how to, how to link the link to it. It's the guidance on mitigation and preventing the spread of COVID-19 in the workplace. So for those of you who don't know, the Occupational Safety and Health Administration, uh, part of the OSHA Act, um, put out as part of the Biden administration a publication on key things that need to happen for businesses to reopen physically. Um, for that, uh, there are a couple of practical um, things that have been put forth and there are some policy things. I'm gonna speed through some of those uh, because you can read the entire document, but there are some key points that I wanna make sure that you take away from our discussion. Because as we talked about before, as Dr. Mendoza said, you know, once we get people in the business, it's important that they stay healthy that we know how to help if there is some type of exposure. As Beverly talked about, once we've got people back, um, it's important to make sure that we um, engage employees um, and we are uh, keeping our firm's cultures a lot, but getting the people back. So how does that happen? So number one, um, OSHA requires that there should be somebody in each office that is designated as what they call the workplace coordinator. That's the person who's not necessarily going to do the contact tracing that Dr. Mendoza talked about, but it's going to be the person who keeps track of the health screenings that you do. Um, OSHA doesn't require a particular health screening mechanism for your employees, whether that's temperature checks, whether that's use of an app, whether that's health screening questions that you may be familiar with. OSHA doesn't designate a particular program that you must use. But what OSHA says is that an employer is required to provide a safe workplace. Um, and for the most part, um, most businesses, especially businesses that are operate as 
simple offices don't really think much about OSHA. Um, it's not like mine safety. It's not like airplanes. It's not like um, other businesses like factories. Uh, most people, when they're in the office setting, don't think of OSHA, but OSHA applies. Um, the act applies, and therefore, employers are required to provide a safe workplace. So what does that mean? With relating to a workplace coordinator, that's the person who's going to keep the health screening data. The reason you need to do that is because HIPAA, right, which is the, for HR people, hopefully you're all familiar with this, medical um, information about your employees must be kept confidential. Um, and because of that, uh, HIPAA requires that there be a limited access to health information. Uh, that's why um, you may be uh, familiar most of the time, even if you have a workplace um, exposure, you are not supposed to identify the people that are exposed. You're only supposed to identify that somebody was exposed and notify people who might be uh, within the zone of, of um, uh, exposure, as it were, as Dr. Mendoza talked about, in terms of doing the contract tracing to notify them so that they can quarantine. Um, so it's important that that workplace coordinator be in place before you reopen the office. Um, that workplace coordinator is also going to have to be the person who provides information to OSHA if you have an exposure and a workplace exposure that causes somebody either to go to the hospital or unfortunately, and hopefully you will not experience this, a fatality. Um, most of us who, who deal with, you know, the office space, I have a law office, don't usually think about that because we don't usually have fatalities that occur in our office space, thankfully. Uh, but with COVID, um, the rules about, um, for OSHA, about notifying OSHA of a workplace exposure that leads to hospitalization, um, illness, or unfortunately, possibly death, um, apply regardless of the size of your office. So when you're picking that workplace coordinator, I, I implore you to pick somebody with experience, an HR manager, uh, your office manager, but somebody who is able to take on that role. Um, and somebody who understands the gravity of the role they are accepting. Because the next thing that you need to do in order to open up your office is you need to assess your facility, both from a practical and physical standpoint. What does that mean? Well, um, break rooms, right? Um, things need to be done so people don't congregate in break rooms, right? Because offices are still required in Miami-Dade County to abide by social distance rules, right? Six feet apart, wearing masks, even within the office. Those rules don't go away just because you've reopened your physical space. So for my office, we have everybody now in office spaces uh, as opposed to in shared work tables um, or in conference rooms, which we used to use. Uh, and we do that so that we limit the um, contact and we can keep the social distancing. When people leave their office, they're wearing masks. We engage in frequent hand washing. All of that is something that when you're opening your office, you need to do. Um, you need to think about how you're going to keep social distancing, what you're gonna do about shared workspaces. I have clients who have taken their shared workspaces and have partitioned them um, using protective uh, programs, uh, face shields, um, or even plexiglass to segregate workspaces. Um, that in and of itself, though, creates an impediment to what Beverly was talking about, which is that connectiveness that we crave when we go back to the office. So even as you are engaging in physically transforming your office space to deal with social distancing rules um, and preventive measures, you still need to figure out how you're going to keep the office culture alive. Um, one of the things that I want to also make clear, and this is something that's in the OSHA guidelines, just because somebody is vaccinated or has received vaccination 
does not mean under OSHA guidelines that they can ignore or exempt from the preventive regulations that might be imposed by the state or the county. That means that even if I have an employee that's been vaccinated, if they walk out of their office, they must be wearing a face mask. Um, they must take preventive steps to wash their hands on a schedule. They get, must be sure that they're not congregating uh, amongst people less than six feet. For OSHA, vaccination is important, but it is not, does not exempt people from other preventative measures. And you as an employer or as an HR manager are going to need to enforce those rules. Um, it's very much important that you have a clear um, reporting and communication program in place. What do I mean by that? I mean that you need to designate somebody, it can be the workplace coordinator, it could be somebody else, to whom employees are going to report concerns. They're going to report things that they might want to see change physically in the office in order to protect them from an exposure or congregation. Um, that reporting needs to go up the chain, obviously. But there also has to be dissemination of information in a clear line so that there are not multiple areas of communication, right? I know this, I, I hate to say this, Beverly might uh, tiss, tiss me, but the workplace, as you know, is a hotbed for gossip and for multiple points of people weighing in on office policies, on, on office uh, events, on decisions that are being made in the office. Um, with respect to COVID prevention, that previous experience in the workplace is detrimental to clear lines of communication. Therefore, it's important to identify for your employees the one person or the one area in which your communications about your prevention programs, your cleaning procedures, the uh, program about uh, taking breaks, taking vacation, um, what can happen outside the workplace that might expose you inside the workplace. All of that is communicated from one central point outward as opposed to multiple sources of communication. Um, clear communication is a key to making sure that when you reopen your office, you can keep control of the way that reopening happens. I just mentioned cleaning procedures. Uh, cleaning procedures happen both during the workplace time and after hours. You need to be able to identify what your programs are who's doing the cleaning, what cleaning you're doing. Uh, my office, other offices have set up sanitation stations. Um, if you've gone to a gym, you might have seen them. It's a place where there are cleaning supplies that you can use to clean off your office space. Uh, sanitizers, hand sanitizers, wipes, and the like. Um, it also means that um, you need to make sure that your employees are making use of that um, and that they're following guidelines. Um, overlaying on this, and so this is not for most employers in Miami-Dade County, but I'm going to mention it. If you are in a union set, right, in which you are, um, you have unionized workforce, you're going to have to remember that, uh, for the most part, uh, because of the way, uh, COVID, uh, came at us, um, most union contracts will require employers to negotiate with the unions if they change office policies. Because you are changing office policies and you have a right to change office policies under Florida law, uh, that doesn't necessarily mean that under a union setting, you don't have an obligation to at least negotiate and inform the union of changes before they're implemented. I just wanna mention that, but that's an, as an aside. Um, in addition, um, key, and I think uh, both Dr. Mendoza and Beverly touched upon this. You need to come up with a backup plan for your key employees. What do I mean by that? So if your office manager is exposed 
outside of the office to COVID, from a family member, a family gathering, from some type of, of, of event, and needs to quarantine for 10 days. If that person is responsible for payroll, and that person is responsible for um, office expenditures, and that person has to sign off on things, some of those things can be done electronically, some of those things can be done um, virtually, but a lot of their responsibilities may not be. You need to be able to have a backup plan that says, if, if you know, I'm making this up, so I, you know, I'm going to use Beverly. If Beverly, as the HR manager, is out and is unable to communicate with her staff or is, is in quarantine, or Dr. Mendoza, as the chief of Scribness, has to quarantine because of an exposure at the, at the emergency room, who is the backup? You need to have that seamless transition because you cannot allow a quarantine to block you continuing to work from your physical space. Um, again, Beverly touched upon this, but it's very important to manage employees' expectations. As Beverly said, think about a year ago, back to January or February uh, or December of 2019 to where we are now. Things have changed, employees are concerned. You need to manage employees' expectations because we're not just going to go and snap our fingers uh, like WandaVision and the entire scene is going to change, right? We're going to have to deal with the new reality. And that means managing employees' expectations. Um, you also have to decide how you're going to get customers or your clients back to your office. What are you going to require? What are you going to do? Right? Most of us have gotten used to client communications and client contacts virtually, like we're doing now. But as we move back to a physical workspace, I know clients who are going to want to come in because they want to be speaking to their advisors right, in the accounting office. They want to be going through the records. How are you going to bring those people back in? You need to think about that, have a plan, and then communicate that plan to employees so they're not surprised when Mr. Jones, who's a client, walks in and they're worried, where has Mr. Jones been? Um, how do I know that he's not going to expose me to COVID? Um, my time is getting shortened, so I'm going to talk about a couple of other things you need to think about. Vaccinations and terminations. Um, one, as it relates to vaccinations, currently under Florida law, with the exception of ADA, right? Americans with Disability um, Act accommodations uh, for people with uh, medical conditions or religious um, objections, Florida law currently allows businesses to require employees to get vaccinated to come back to work physically. There are a couple of law firms in New York, there are a couple of businesses in California, and, and a smattering that you may have seen in the news who have made that their official policy. Other employee, employers are taking a, we'd like to encourage you to get vaccinated, but we're not requiring it. Um, grocery stores uh, and the like, you may have seen that. What you choose to do for your business is, is your choice. You have a, a, a menu of options, but when you have those options, you need, again, as I said, to communicate those to your employees so they know what's going on. And remember, even if somebody's vaccinated, they still have to follow the protection guidelines within the office. You can't allow somebody to say, I've already had my vaccinations. I don't need to wear a face mask. I don't need to go through the health screening if that's required. I don't need to. That's not the way that OSHA is working their program. In addition, um, and this is a touchy subject, I will admit, for the most part, pre-COVID, most employers did not worry about what their employees did after hours or on their breaks or on their vacation, right? We just, we didn't worry about that so long as it didn't impact the business. Now, those events 
do impact the business, right? If you have an employee and, and I had an, uh, an employer come to me, they had a social media post by an employee three months ago who was out at a gathering um, where most of the people were unmasked. Uh, this employee videotaped themselves out at a, at a cultural event in which almost nobody was wearing masks. Person tried to come back to work that Monday and the employer told them that they would have to quarantine. The employee objected to quarantining because they said they weren't sick. They didn't know that they were exposed. Uh, they, they, you know, they offered to take a COVID test and the employer said, our policy is that if you engage in an activity that might expose you to COVID, our policy says you must quarantine away from the office. The person didn't want to quarantine because their particular job, they were an hourly employee, and their particular job was difficult to do from home. The empl employer had to decide not only to enforce the policy, but when the employee tried to come back, they actually terminated the employee for violating the policy. You as an employer or as a manager have to decide what you're going to do about that. But I want to leave you with this thought, right? Businesses are vulnerable to lawsuits, unfortunately, from people who are going to claim that they were exposed or got COVID in the workplace. And that can lead to exposure to the business for liability. As you may or may not know, Publix uh, grocery chain is currently facing a wrongful death lawsuit uh, by an employee, an elderly employee who passed away, and his estate is sued Publix. The motion to dismiss that case was denied by the judge, which means Publix is going to have to defend against those allegations. You do not want to be that business. Um, with that, I'm going to invite my fellow panelists, Beverly and Dr. Mendoza, to join us for the Q&A session. Excellent. So um, I'm going to ask the, the, the easy question, Dr. Mendoza, which is um, one of the questions was, how do you recommend capturing the contact tracing information once you have it? How do, how do you tell employers how you're going to store that information so you can access it? Yeah, great question. So one of the things that we do as a company is we maintain a proprietary dashboard uh, with all that information that's, that's collated and it's, it's, it's stored in a HIPAA compliant server and the access to it is limited to only those authorized um, administrators within the company. Uh, so in other words, you can keep track of, we keep track of, um, you know, dates of exposure, who's been exposed. Uh, we de-identify the data when it goes in. So we don't have names in the, da in, in, in the database. We have de-identified de data uh, but we do know, you know, we can track it by classroom, faculty, uh, maybe the section that they're in. And that, that's an ongoing process. And you can track that, you know, you can graph that out. You can talk about exposures per week, per day, per facility. If you're talking about a grocery store chain, for example, what you're talking about, if we get involved with a grocery store chain, you can track, you know, which departments within a grocery store chain, which grocery stores themselves, what sites are being exposed. And that's all in an active live dashboard. So that's something that we do on our end and the only people who have access to it are the authorized individuals within that company and anybody the actual contact tracers who are getting on the phone uh, and by the way going back to your point about communication and, and beverly's point as well uh, about open communication our company takes on the position and takes on the responsibility of along with with the whoever the assigned person at, at your company or employer would be to introduce ourselves help introduce uh, um uh, uh, company policy and what to expect. Hey, we're Scrivas. You're going to be getting, you know, we're, you're going to hear from us. We're an authorized uh, partner with company X or, uh, or institution X. Um, and we'll communicate with you ongoing uh, tips and tricks and that kind of thing, but also company policy and what to expect if you have an exposure. Um, but ideally, you keep that information in one place in a HIPAA secure server. Um, and only certain authorized individuals have uh, have access to that, and we do it in a de-identified manner. 
Okay, I'm going to ask a, gr a question for the group. So this one is, is uh, I think we'll start uh, with Dr. Mendoza and then ask Beverly, but the question is, what should employers do when, when a confirmed case of COVID-19 is identified in the workplace setting? Somebody calls the, the employer and says, hey, I've now tested positive for COVID, go. All right, so, so Dr. Mendoza, what, what's the first thing the employer should do? First thing is you hopefully have a COVID exposure policy in place, but stay home. Instruct the employee to stay home, and if they need it, to seek medical attention. I mean, most people, as you know, most people get COVID are mildly symptomatic, but if they're, you know, symptomatic at all um, or have concerns about what, you know, how they're feeling, make sure they seek medical attention. First and foremost, stay home, wait to hear back from us, the employer or the company on what to do next and seek medical attention if you need it, first and foremost. Okay, Beverly, now that you've, you've told the employee to stay home, what do you do next? Right. Actually, we've been through this drill. <laughs> so I'm happy to share from a, from a recent experience. So we did all of the things you said, Dr. Mendoza. So I'm feeling good about that. Fortunately, though, in the office, we also keep a log of who's using the office and, and, and when they were there. So we know who's been there. Everything is logged in. In this particular case as well, after making sure we're attending to that individual with all the advice you've just given, we then confidentially, without disclosing who, reached out to any of the other colleagues who may have been around this person, not only at the time they were symptomatic, but we went backward. We actually went back for probably maybe a week, I don't know, um, a, a, quite a while and reached out and let them know without identifying the person that there was someone that in the office that they'd possibly been into contact with. And by the way, I want to give a, a, a shout out to the Momentum people. They kept social distancing and they were wearing masks there in the office. Um, we also then, we had just had our, our COVID deep cleaning procedure. I think it was on a Saturday. And once we knew of this, um, even though the employee hadn't been back since Saturday, we, we closed the office, we shut the office, had another deep cleaning, um, advised others that for a while, we were gonna keep the office clean until I think it was maybe 72 hours or so after the deep clean. And then people were giving uh, only to HR in a very secured way, um, negative results that those who might've been affected didn't have COVID. Fortunately, not another person got COVID. We were we were very blessed in that situation. Um, the, when the employee was all clear with you know negative tests, then you know the employee was able. Although I, I think they probably took a little extra time. So, Dr. Mendoza, I, I hope we passed. Yeah, well, I mean that's a lot of work, and that's exactly the point I was was. earlier. It's a lot of work. It was a whole day for me. Yeah, it was a whole thing. day. I, you know, the purpose is why we, we, we pivoted here. The, the purpose is to have that one person, you know, like you maybe, you know, being, okay, I'm, I, you know, I'm in charge of the overall, but, you know, offloading that work of getting the test results, you know, uploading the test results, identifying right. people anonymously, uh, doing all that right. legwork because it's not just about, and you have to know exactly you know, when they were symptomatic and how many days before Correct. and going into the laws. And, and there's some there's some offices or some employers. And you know, like I said, we do a lot of work with schools uh, and we're doing with universities locally and private schools. They can't you know, they don't want to shut down an entire school. So they've been able to maintain, you know, maybe maybe you, what you're taking is a group, for example, it's happened in a couple of schools, a group that eat lunch together outside. You have to quarantine them. And but you're not quarantining the whole school. But you really get very right. pinpoint and very strategic about who you're, you know, how you identify the exposures, it's really important. It, it, it is. What you went through, if you have to take hours, you know, days to do that, how much how much are you yep. losing in productivity? So that's kind of where we come in. But you're right. That's the right thing to do. Uh, the deep cleaning, we know that deep cleanings work to a certain degree, but really more in the immediate sense. I mean, uh, it's we're kind of a little more reassured now that really the most, the most um, a common way of transmitting COVID is airborne, and droplets, but right. also airborne. So, so uh, you know, being outside on a bench or eating lunch outside, you know, within minutes, COVID dies in sunshine and hot, hot, humid areas. That's pretty, you know, it's, that's, that's very reassuring. Um, but even in the classroom setting, you know, deep cleanings, unless you're really doing deep cleaning, like every time between everybody, you know, every office, you know, turnover, if you're having people, really deep cleaning needs to happen 
probably uh, or a cleaning uh, has to happen almost at every turnover. If not, just you know, individual hygiene practices are going to suffice. Whether it's a hand washing and right. and the, the hand sanitizer. And the and number one, number one is mask wearing. Number two is don't put yourself in a situation where you're in a small enclosed space right. without good circulating air. Another thing you want to consider if you're in an office space, say, space you're going to be back in there. Look into and invest into. AC, AC or air conditioning filtration systems that work. They do have AC filters. You have to upgrade. They have to sometimes upgrade the system, which will filter out the COVID-19 virus. I'm wow. looking at that as well. I think there was like a UV version of yeah. that too, Dr. Mendoza. Yep, right. And I'm just going to lay over that. That obviously is Beverly related her story. There was a lot of communication. There's a lot of communication yeah. from one source point to the various employees and back. And there was a log kept of results, right? Both positive and negative. Absolutely. And obviously the person was quarantined for 10 to 14 days, and then they were required to be tested before they would even be let back into the office. Right. And, and that's one of the things that you have to deal with this. This is good. And, and so for employers, the issue is going to be, you know, how do you have people, right? So even if people are exposed and they're working from home for hourly employees, if they're working, then you can get them paid. If they're not working, then you know you, you have PTO, you right. have other policies right. that may fall into place. Um, currently, as we know, uh, both the Emergency Sick Pay Leave and the Emergency Family Medical Leave Act um, expired on the 31st of December. Uh, there's some talk about bringing that back. Uh, that's not really a, a conversation for right this moment because we don't know what will happen. Um, and so, there are voluntary programs that employers can do when people are out um, uh, quarantining, but that's for an individual employer to take advantage of. I know we did get a question about a recent Florida bill about you know protecting businesses uh, to avoid sort of the public's lawsuit, let's call it. I hate to, I hate to name a business as it were, but um, at the moment, until we see what the end result of that um, act is, that legislation, it really, we really can't talk about it um, because there's going to be negotiation about that bill. There are going to be exceptions. Um, and so I think you're going to have to um, wait to answer that question. But the question that came up as we were talking about it, and Dr. Mendoza pointed this out, is obviously mask wearing is important. Uh, the question was raised for, for us as a panelist, uh, what do you do about an employee who says, for medical reasons, I can't wear a mask? So. I'm going to take this from a legal point of view, and then I'm going to ask Dr. Mendoza to jump in, and, and Beverly, please feel free to comment, which is which is this. Um, COVID has not erased other employment laws, okay? Right. It doesn't, it hasn't erased pay laws, it hasn't erased leave laws, it hasn't erased any of those laws, and one of the laws that exists is something called, as I, I touched upon, the Americans with Disability Act law. For most people who have to deal with this, it, it applies to businesses with 15 employers or more, um, is that if an employee comes and says they need an accommodation because of a medical condition, a medical condition is read broadly, um, and it doesn't impact the employer's operations, and I'm being very general when I say here, because we could spend three hours just discussing the intricacies of the ADA, but let's, let's not. So if somebody comes to Beverly and says as the HR manager, hey, I have a medical condition that makes it impossible for me to wear a mask because I have a breathing issue and I can't wear the mask because it, 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 it will be a problem. That's a request for an ADA accommodation. So here's the, here's the rub and then I'll let people jump in uh, my other, my other panels. Um, there are things that people might be able to do instead, right? Face, face masks, right? As opposed to a mask over their nose and mouth, a face shield. Um, it may be that you require people only in particular common areas to wear the mask for only a short period of time, right? Um, it may be that if somebody says to you, hey, I can't wear the mask and we're going to a, a, a non-remote workplace, physical workplace, in order to protect the, your fellow employees, if you can't wear a mask, you may have to work remotely. That may be the accommodation because as an employer, you have a responsibility to protect the entire workforce. And so that's the accommodation you might have to read. Uh, Dr. Mendoza, you might have some 
alternatives to, to, to face masks that are, are facial coverings that might exist. You know, I, I think you hit it. I'm not going to comment on the legality of the ADA. And I'm trying to think which medical conditions would prevent you from actually wearing a face mask or any, you know, um, I wouldn't even think, you know, even uh, older individuals who have COPD or pulmonary fibrosis or severe asthma, they, they're, they're the highest risk individuals. I mean, if, if in a non-COVID era, I'd probably recommend those people wearing a face mask when they get on a plane anyway. So, I mean, to get flu or anything else. So, I, you know, I can't comment on the individual medical exemptions. Um, you know, anything that affects the lung capacity or breathing, you're already at high risk for super high risk of COVID. So I, I would see it as really, un, uh, it would, you know, kind of unwise to go around in public places or exposed um, without a mask. And knowing that, I probably would recommend that person for, for their own, I mean, their physician would probably recommend also that they, they work remotely or, or in secured areas. Um, but I mean, I, 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 it's, it's, it's probably case by case basis. Beverly, you want to take the last comment? Uh, because we're going to have to close out the question and answer period as, as we close the program. I'm not sure that I'd be able to add anything that you all haven't added on that. I, I know that that's something we think about in terms of the accommodations, for sure. We know that we'll be faced with that request in the future. And I think that same thing, the same thing we'll have to think about if, as we consider whether or not we make uh, vaccines mandatory or not. So I just think we have to keep it in mind. All right. And so uh, I've been asked, uh, we're going to close this program. You're welcome to stay. Um, I'm going to ask Tammy uh, Davidson, who's the co-chair of our HR committee, to come up. And so I'll ask Dr. Mendoza and Beverly to turn off your cameras. I'm going to uh, introduce you. Uh, Tammy, who will close out the program. Thank you all for joining us. Uh, you Thank may you stay much. afterwards. Uh, and uh, network, as Al Alfred said at the beginning of the program. And with that, Tammy, I turn the program over to you and thank everybody for the opportunity to participate today. Be well, be safe. Thank you. Well, thank you, everyone. Wasn't this wonderful? Aaron, Beverly, Dr. Mendoza, this was terrific, informative. Not only is this platform wonderful, and we thank the chamber for doing this, but what insights this give us and what questions we probably need more answers to. I can tell you that I want you to do two things today. One, I want you to look at your calendar for March 18th. March 18th is going to be a larger event for HR Insights. We've got more panelists, more topics and maybe even a few surprises and awards and congratulations for some great folks. So please mark your calendars for March 18th. Secondly, we are going to leave this networking open for you. We're going to leave it open for the next 30 minutes, and we hope that all of you join us and have a wonderful uh, networking opportunity on this terrific site. So thank you, everyone. I think we're going back into the Stage four. <laughs>